This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Okay, welcome to Unsiloed. Uh, this is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with Eric Johnson, who is a professor at Columbia Business School and also the director of their Center for Decision Sciences. Um, he is also the author of uh, a book, um, which I think, I guess it, it kind of ties together a lot of the research that you've been doing for the last uh, couple decades, and it's called um, the, the Elements of, of Choice, Why the Way We Decide Matters. Now, Eric, I mean, at, at the end of the book, you, you, you kind of say that the takeaway of the book is, is this. One is that choice ar architecture is unavoidable, right? So a lot of people might think, well, I don't want to influence people's choices. I want to be ethical and I want to let them decide. Well, you argue that that's impossible, right? No matter what you do, you're going to have an influence on how people decide because of the way in which you present the options, right? So it's unavoidable. And if it's unavoidable, then that means that you do have to think ethically to some degree about how you present choices, whether you are a government or a company or even even as an individual, perhaps interacting with your spouse and you have an example That's right. of, of, of that, right? There's, there's no way that you can kind of get around this. And you say you're not interested in kind of the philosophical side of, you know, free will and so forth. But, but you know, I think you, you, you come down with a nuanced position, which is that, yeah, of course, people are ultimately making choices, but the, they're going to be influenced by, you know, all sorts of, of things, whether, you know, consciously or, or subconsciously. So, you know, has choice, is choice architecture, I mean, we have schools of physical architecture. You make the analogy between physical and, and physical architecture and choice architecture, which I, I want to get into. But, you know, we have entire schools of architecture, right, that are, that are separate from business, that are separate from arts and sciences, separate from law and so forth. Do we need to have an entire school of, of choice architecture, given how I'm going to be a little bit more is? modest and say it's good to have a good book that's a guide to choice architecture. Uh, that's a start. And I do teach a course on choice architecture when, when uh, schedules permit it. But since we're all choice architects and we all can influence how, how we um, – pose problems to people, I think we all should be aware of it. Now, whether you need a school for that, um, not not everyone who does a, makes a nice uh, design of a living room has to have a degree in architecture, um, but being aware of the principles is pretty damn useful. And so I would say that, you know, it's really useful no matter, we're all presenting choices to people. So let me give you like one real simple example. You always have an order in which you present options. Mm -hmm. Right. There's no way of, you couldn't say, oh, here's a menu and put everything at once. There has to be a first dish, a second dish, a third dish. Now, it turns out the trick is there are good and bad ways of doing that. If you want someone to pick a certain option, yeah. it's going to depend a little bit upon the details, but there is a good or bad way. So an uh, example that I had a lot of fun with uh, reading the book is um, – in ice dancing, you know, that stuff that they show on Saturday afternoons, right. uh, counter-programming against like the uh, NFL or, um, for example, the Eurovision Song Contest. Mm -hmm. It turns out it's really much better in those situations to be last, yeah. which is counterintuitive, right? You would think first is always better. And that's sort of what I thought before I started reading the literature. But the reason is, notice, you don't have control, right? There's, you know, the... the um, song from Azerbaijan, the song from France, the th song from the Netherlands. By the time you get to the end, you've forgotten a lot of them. So in that case where there's a sequential order and you have no control, it turns out it's best to be last. Now, right. there's no neutral order. Someone's going to be last. So you have to have some way of, you know, sort of being aware of that. And if you are trying to encourage the, uh, the, the group from Moldova, you would want them to be last. There's clearly an effect. And right. being ignorant is really no excuse. Yeah, I tell my students, you know, when, when they sign up for job interviews, they should be, you know, pay careful attention to, you know, what, what slot they, they, they go into, right? But, but of course, there's, there's more context to that, right? So, you know, you talk about how if there's, it's a short list, then the, right. there's, it's going to differ from, you know, whether there's a long list. It, it depends on whether or not you have sort of a sequential presentation versus kind of a, a simultaneous uh, presentation, Right. And I was thinking about this last last night. I was at a restaurant, and um, you know, it was one of these Michelin restaurants, right? Where and and 
um, the dinner menu, there, there were basically three options. But the wine menu, there must have been like 5,000 options, right? And, and, and of course, I, you know, I was thinking about your book when I was at this, at this restaurant. And you, you mentioned that there's this thing called menu science that all of the restaurateurs yes. are exposed to. And it turns out to be mostly, mostly bunk. So, so part of what, what, what I found interesting about the book is that you know, the, our folk psychology about kind of what matters to the extent that people think about it does not always line up with what the kind of academic research suggests or our intuitions are pretty bad too i mean i would have always said being first is last then i think the key is our principles and the mm -hmm. and principles aren't going to be new to anyone who studies psychology but we're pretty limited in the amount of information we can contend with at any one point in time so if it's on a paper menu the stuff up top will get more attention and then i'll stop mm -hmm. I won't read the entire menu. Yeah. So I suspect the wines your restaurateur wanted you to order are fairly early on each category because yeah. you get to stop. But let's take the same thing. Imagine that was an oral menu where the wines are being repeated to you. Then it's not so clear being first because you're going to forget that. So, so there's some basic principles that really unify a lot of choice architecture. But it's, it's not going to be as simple as saying always present be the first option or always present three options. You actually have to look at how people work to understand choice architecture. And that's sort of the thing that I think the book contributes more than saying just look, it matters. It's this is saying why it matters. Well, you know, you, you talk about a lot of overlaps with a lot of other disciplines. One, one area that you didn't highlight, but which I was thinking of when I was reading that section was, you know, agenda control in, in politics. Right. So, you know, in, in politics, if you have, you know, from arrows and possibility theorem, right, if you have a couple different options and you're going to be doing like majority voting, then it, it depends on, you know, wh which kind of lead in votes or, you know, if you if you have a playoff competition, like, you know, the you know, the order in which you, you, you know, play your uh, opponents is, is going to ultimately influence the outcome. And so you, you talk about with with a sequential, um, you, you know, list uh, in your in your brain, you, you sort of view it as as a series of um, sometimes a view of series of, of playoffs, right? So you know you get the first thing in your brain, and then the second thing comes along, and you're like, okay, right. is the second thing better than the first thing? And 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 so so you know, I mean, it's kind of like agenda control, but the the legislature is the the you know the brain of the decision maker, right? Or the speaker of the house, or the head of the committee. I mean, I think if I was much more Machiavellian than I, re I am, I, this would be an exciting research area. But even a simple example, like in politics, we know that the, and this is actually astounding to me, we know that the person who's first on the ballot, he or she is going to get a bounce from that. Typically, yeah. they're short lists, and people will say, why isn't, you know, Greg the right candidate? And you'll mm -hmm. get, you know, a, a vote increase that's almost as large as you typically get out of get out the vote campaigns. I mean, the, the interesting thing is it's probably the case that Al Gore lost the election in Florida, not because of hanging chads, if people remember that, or anything about butterfly ballots. It's because Jeb's mm -hmm. brother, George, was first in the ballot all over the state. And that we can look at other states where they actually randomize the order. And that difference is much larger than the number of votes that yeah. were gathered for for George in Florida, no, I mean it, that seems there that there there is a rational reason for that, right? So you know we talk about optimal stopping rules, and you know it probably doesn't make sense in in a typical search context to to go through the the entire list, right? I mean certainly when you get thirty eight million results on on Google, you're not going to check them all out. And you know I teach a course on on the airline industry and and talk about how um, you know in the early days of the um, consumer reservation, the, the customer reservation systems, right? The ways in which United and American and, and Delta were able to kind of, you know, get market share was to control these terminals that the travel agents had access to. And the travel agents would, Correct. you know, see the United at the top and they'd be like, okay, well, you know, it looks good. <laughs> and, they, and they would, they would, they would click on it. And, and I mean, it, it kind of makes sense that you, you wouldn't go all the way to, to, to the bottom of, of the list, right? Um, right. And standard economics would agree with you, right? That search costs, search art costs, cost something. It's hard to read each of those. The issue is, I think, this is we tend to be very present biased or front loaded in costs. So mm -hmm. that's why they're, you know, for example, on an airline site, you typically stop too soon 
if you're being yeah. an economist, you should look further, but people stop too soon. They basically take the upfront costs and weight them too much. And you can make it even worse by making the fonts hard to read or, you yeah. know, putting things out of alphabetical order. But you can change search cost as a designer. But certainly people don't seem to search optimally. That's one of the clear sort of research findings in that literature. Yeah, I, I did some work with, with an airline a couple of years back, and it was all about kind of designing the menu for the purpose of gaining some incremental revenue, right? So, you know, how can we kind of change the defaults and, and, and so forth? And and you highlight that there's, there's a tension there, right? So there, there's a tension between trying to, you know, maximize the objectives of, of the airline and then, you know, deliver to the customer the thing that is best for the customer. Now, on, on, under some circumstances, there, there's an alignment, right? Um, and that the best interest of the airline is to satisfy the customer. But in other cases, you know, there, there's there's a conflict. But but you highlight some situations where, where neither objective is, is being served. And you talk about uh, your work with this um, large automotive company, right, where they, they had a default, but the default was always like the lowest priced option, right? And, and, and you know, th this seems like it's not good for anybody. Or, for instance, um, when I was selecting a primary care physician with my health care provider a couple years ago, you know, it was listed in alphabetical order, right? And, you know, I guess they thought, well, you know, we don't want to decide, so we're just going to let the alphabet decide. And, you know, there was no way I was going to get past B. I mean, it was like, it's just... And, and so, you know, in that case, it, that's why, you know, you have so many like locksmiths named like AAA locksmith or, or you know, right. qu quadruple or A plumber and stuff like that. I'm kidding about that. But, you know, if you wanted market share, you put your name at the beginning of the alphabet. Um, yeah. And I think that's a great Or if you're an author, you're right? If you're a co-author for academic papers. That's right. <laughs> apparently. Well, particularly, you know, that differs a little bit in economics. It's always done al alphabetically. Yeah. In psychology, we tend to do it by contribution. So that's mm -hmm. one of the differences. It's funny that I think that actually, from an economic perspective, psychologists have a much more sensible author ordership scheme than economists. Um, but I think that's very true. It's a great example of ignorance. You know, we just don't, we're not aware that these things make have an influence. And so amazing, this very large, very sophisticated auto company, you know, always had the cheapest option on their configurator. The, this is the website you go to to build yeah. a car. And there are a bunch of choices there. There were 56 different choices you got to make, but in every case, the cheapest one was pre-selected. Now, that's fine if you're the cheapest person in the world, but if you're driving a car on the German autobahns, it's not such a good idea to have the smallest engine. In fact, it's right. pro probably unsafe, not to mention unhappy. So they were basically making influencing people's choices that not only hurt their customers, because their customers didn't want those options, but them, because they were selling cars that were that were lower in price than they wanted mm -hmm. to. So it was a lose-lose situation by ignoring choice architecture. One more quick example. I was doing some work um, with the Department of Education who designing school choice. Mm -hmm. And there were places that alphabetized school lists. Now, if you wanted to, you probably would alphabetize the list, particularly if it was online, with something like quality or mm -hmm. distance from home. But I don't yeah. think you really were looking for schools that begin with A. Right. Yeah. Well, okay. So in in those situations where you've got kind of a profit-maximizing designer of the choice architecture, th there's going to be some potential conflict. But but you also talk about cases where, look, this is all about public interest, right? So the designers of the choice architecture presumably are interested in kind of you know maximizing the welfare of the the, the deciders. Um, and so there, I mean, it's a little easier, but but it's still difficult to come up with a criteria for, you know, well-designed system, right? Because you need some kind of benchmark against which you can measure the choice, right? So if you know that choice architecture A will lead to choice A and choice architecture B will lead to choice B, like how do you, you know, in theory, what you want to do is you want to make sure that they choose the thing that they, quote, really want. But when, when preferences are are endogenous. And I think that's, that's a key, you, one of your key insights is that, um, you know, preferences are, are assembled or, you know, they're, 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 we don't walk into a decision knowing what we want. Right. And that, that's, that's an assumption that economists make, you know, at least introductory economists will make. Right. And it makes the world so much easier, but you know, when preferences are, are endogenous, how do we, how do we determine, 
you know, whether or not we are designing a system which steers people to the, quote, right decision, right? So if you think about, you know, the most famous uh, image in, in all of the social sciences right, in the book, which is the one that you and your co-author, uh, you know, created around organ donation. And I, I use this all the time in, in a bunch of my, my classes. So thank you for that. Um, you know, how do we know what people really want? You know, do they really want to donate their organs or do they really want to, you know, hold on to them? Like, how do we know whether the, the Austrian system is the right one or the German one is the, is the right one? So you get to a really deep point. And, it, and one thing is, if we are assembling our preferences, how do we know even for ourselves when we're assembling yeah. the right preference? So how do I know? And the thing about organ donation is we never know how we feel when it's actually done. Mm -hmm. At least, you know, that's at least one view of the world. But it's clear that most people agree to be donors. So in some sense, if you're going to try and... So if you, in other words, if you, had a for, if you had a forced... So one way would be to have a forced right. choice, right? So right. that would be... A, if you had a forced choice, that would be how you, you would elicit it. But even with a forced choice, I guess you'd have to randomize and do all sorts of other things, Exactly. Right? Yeah, you, would, you want to be careful. But one thing we do do, if you ask people, do you want to be a donor? Just straight up. No, you minimize the choice architecture. They will say yes. Now, they don't want to think about it because it's not very pleasant to think about. One of the reasons I think choice architecture is so powerful there is people want to avoid making an active choice. You know, somewhere below going to the dentist is the decision, what do I want to happen to my body when I'm dead? It's mm -hmm. not something people want to think about. But what's true is that if they are forced to think about it, and in some studies we've done this, you can't go on to the next page of the questionnaire until you make a choice. And then, of course, we randomize the order to try and counterbalance order effects. Most people, not everyone, but most people say they will be, they want to be a donor. So that's the first thing is, you know, if you're going to do, unless there were big mistakes for getting it wrong, you want to do what most people think they would do if they really thought about it. Now, well, but the wait, second hold on, thing that's, is, but, but that's, yeah, but that's not, good point. we don't, so, so, Asking them and getting a response is, doesn't mean that they've really thought about it. I mean, would you would you really wanted to know what they would what they quote wanted? Wouldn't you have to make them read a couple books on you know lives saved and the process and you know the probability that they're going to be you know have their lives terminated early or you know what whatever? I mean, wouldn't how much consideration would be enough to 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 know feel confident that this is really what they want? So. Uh, obviously, what most people do when they're well informed, as you point out, is one criterion, yeah. and that's an important criterion. But that is not the only criterion. There are lots of domains where you can actually get people to identify good and bad choices. One of the things that's in the book and in research is this idea of dominance. Imagine you're in a supermarket and you're buying this soap powder that is more expensive than all the other soap powders and weaker. Mm -hmm. You'd be pretty clear that's a mistake. That's what we call dominance. It's, you know, sort of like if you actually were paying attention, you would never choose that. Yet people do. So in health insurance, there are lots of now studies where you show people menus and they pick options that are have less coverage or more expensive than others. Mm -hmm. That's a clear mistake. So that's a place where doing choice architecture is important. And your goal is to prevent people from making that kind of stupid choice. And there's a nice work done by uh, Super, uh, Justin Sindor, uh, Subar Bhargava, and George Lowenstein, where they do a nice study where they actually show in a real company people are making about 40% of the time these kinds of mistakes. So that's a place where the choice architect's job is relatively easy. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing to do is just to see if you do different ways of presenting options, and you see people are making different choices, then at least you realize you have a problem. So if I do the organ donation choice with two different defaults and show that people are making different choices, I'm going to say, whoa, I have to do some work here. And that work probably includes giving people an education about what happens and seeing what they do. So you're absolutely right there. So I think if they're being inconsistent, that's a diagnosis. It's not a solution, but it's a diagnosis that these preferences are being assembled. And, and that's but what's, really what's interesting important. is that the choice architecture has a much bigger impact than any level of education, right? So, you know, you, you showed some cases where, you know, people are exposed to all this literature and, they're getting, and, you know, it moves the needle a little bit, but not nearly as much as kind of just changing the default. And, and one, one case that you talked about in the book, which I wasn't really familiar with, which was even more astounding, was end-of-life care. Right. And how I mean, this, this is a huge, huge, huge decision. Right. And yet, 
you know, even when people are, are, are have the, the default explained to them, they, they still just go to the default. Like that to me is, I mean, that's such a huge, huge decision. I mean, is it, is it just, the, is it, is it that the decisions we, we, I mean, one would think that it's the decisions that we care less about that would be more easily influenced, but it seems like it's the ones that we care, we, we don't want to think about the most that are most easily right. influenced, right? This gets to the point of, you know, wanting to avoid conflict and avoid averse work-like situations. Um, and I think that's actually a very good example because people do tend to, if you give them the default and they say, oops, by the way, that was set randomly. There's some yeah. very nice work and very few people will change from the default. Now, what that says to me is this is truly assembled and they were looking for an easy way out of the decision. And, you know, I think one of the issues is I think the worst time to ask somebody what they want to do with end-of-life care is when they're near at the end yeah. of their life. I mean, yeah. they're stressed out. They don't want to exactly start reading. But if you think about trying to help people have advanced directives that are done when they're healthy, when they actually do have some education, when you can actually see them. Another thing to look at, like the organ donation case, is what do most people do? So there are people who actually change their mind in certain situations, and they decide to go from one default to the other. They say, no, I don't want the the life-preserving um, care. I want to essentially do comfort care. I want to switch. I think those switches are informative. But it's not going to be as simple as an economist would say it is where I know absolutely what the right answer is for everybody. But you certainly have hints of what's better and again, going back to the notion of dominance, you know, the fact that you're making a mistake that this is clearly ba a bad choice helps out in some situations. But you're right. It's going to be a little bit more difficult. Luckily, for many decisions that have economic implications, you can look at the math. And other decisions that have moral and life satisfaction, I think then you really have to ask people to think hard about things they might not want to think hard about. Well, you mentioned there are three reasons why defaults have such a big impact. You know, one is about ease or just kind of greasing the wheels of, of, of decision making, which is a big part of the book. Um, second thing is endorsement. And, and here, I guess it depends on who is kind of architecting the, the choice, right? So if it's a doctor, uh, then, you know, who says, well, you know, surgery is the you know, what we're, what most people do, but Hey, we've got this other option, right? So, so, you know, the person doing it presumably. Um, and then the third is, is endowment, which is sort of like, you know, you, you've got it. So you don't really want to, you know, you have to think hard about, you know, whether or not you should switch. So, so, you know, to get to this endorsement point, right. Is, is, is it important for the decision architect to, um, I guess, get tr the trust, you know, get, I mean, when, 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 you know, if we go to Netflix and Netflix presents us with a menu, if we're, if we're suspicious of Netflix, if we think Netflix is just trying to get us addicted or something like that, does that kind of make the, the defaults less, less effective? How important is kind of trust in um, the kind of helping us to navigate these, these paths? So I think this is a neglected part of firms when they think about choice architecture. One stage is I don't think it makes a difference, so I don't want to influence people. Now, a second one it's, is that I think it influences people and want to do it in a way that makes me better off. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually, you know, short term, perhaps increases profitability. A well-known um, ex-U.S. president uh, made the default on their website that all gifts became weekly donations. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. I saw that, and you may have seen that. that. I thought, that was, I thought that was kind of that, brilliant in a nefarious way. We're actually way. analyzing that data now. It turns out, of course, the FEC, Federal Election Commission, has that data. So we actually have six million records of people who've been exposed to the default. Mm -hmm. Now, I think the thing that that's clearly short term, you know, gets you donations, and maybe you only care about the six weeks before the election. But at the same time, I think there's a, a increase in suspicion even among donors. Mm -hmm. And a number of them, something like about 10, 10 or 12 percent, ask for their money back. Mm -hmm. So that's essentially trust that's been burnt for a short-term gain. And this is not the only thing that marketers have ever done that increases short-term profits at a longer-term cost. But I think it's a great example. 
Right. And there's, there's other examples of these nefarious defaults, like, uh, you know, where Comcast will sign you up for, a, or a credit card will sign you up for a, uh, you know, discounted rate, and then, you know, you get trapped with this much higher rate that you're unaware of. Right. And I think that's a great example, too, of this notion of present bias, that we look at the immediate consequences and not the longer-term consequences. And that's true in lots of psychology, but particularly choice architecture. Well, you described it's this even one hard, scenario. By the way, when I, oh, I'm sorry. It's even hard, by the way, when I've looked at, uh, at cable to find out even how much it costs at the right. end of the 12-month period. They don't tell you. Well, you talked about this one scenario where you and a colleague tried to um, change the privacy settings. <laughs> I think was it on on uh, on on one of your uh, one of these companies, and and it was so complicated and difficult that you just gave up. Yeah, I mean, putting up barriers. The term I think that people often use now is sludge. A nudge mm -hmm. is one thing. Sludge is when you try and raise barriers to keep people from doing things that are in their best interest. And that that one I loved because they actually it was a telephone company. And they asked for my phone number twice. Now, right. if there's one thing a telephone company knows about me after they have my name and address, they probably know the telephone number. And so this was actually quite fun because it was on um, uh, NPR, it was a reporter. And so I, I think they found out that this is a, not always a good long-term way of building trust with customers. Yeah. Well, of course, you know, one thing that's new in the last couple of decades is the availability of online interactions, which generates massive amounts of data. It's also super easy to run A-B tests and so forth. But this idea of choice architecture, I mean, it's been with us forever. And you, you know, you quote Winston Churchill, who said that, you know, we designed the buildings and then the built, well, we shaped the buildings and the buildings shape us. And I didn't know this story about Parliament, right? And, you know, when he rebuilt Parliament, he rebuilt it in the old way because he thought that the design of the building influenced the you know, the, the, the functioning of democracy in, in, and, you know, I'm wondering if you could do some kind of empirical analysis on the design of various parliaments around the world and, and, you know, whether that has some predictive value on how the governments run. So one of the fun things about writing a book is you get to, to dive deeply into things that you might not do otherwise. And the Churchill case, he was convinced that there were two sides to the House of Commons and that that was important for essentially why, for the most part, Britain has been dominated by two parties. Mm -hmm. Because instead of, like in the U.S., we have a semicircle, you can look at people behind you and to the side. Um, there, you look directly at the opposition. And so you weren't as concerned with what was going on with the backbenchers. Literally, the people behind you are called the backbenchers, but rather staring in the face of the gauntlet of the opposition. So what's really interesting about that is he thought, you know, that that architecture changed behavior. And I think it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's clear that the way we design buildings changes the way we behave, it changes who we interact with. And the same thing is obviously true with choices. Yeah. And, and you, you have an example in there from an airport and kind of how you can funnel people into different, uh, you know, exits and so forth. I actually remember hearing a talk by someone who was a um, chief strategy officer for an art museum. And they talked about how they, you know, the curators would design these um, exhibits uh, with a goal, you know, a journey in mind. And they would use like sensor data and, and kind of, um, you know, beacon data. And they discovered that people were not navigating this the way they wanted them to go. So they went in and they rearranged all the walls to kind of make sure that people would. So, you know, you talk about slotting allowances, right? And I, I in my strategy class, we, we have, I do a case on the cereal industry and, you know, we talk about how important it is that, you know, you get the end caps and people in retail, they understand this, right? They know that if you put stuff at eye level, you know, you're going to sell more stuff. And if, if you, you know, put it on the end of the aisle, you know, you, you, you sell, sell more stuff, right? So, um, so, you know, choice architecture is, it has a physical element and it's always been with us. Um, but, but now, right, it's almost like, you know, we, we can do it on steroids just because we, we can, the, running trials and running experiments in the physical environment is, is much more difficult, right? I mean, you'd do like, I don't know, you'd just do these little experiments in the lab or maybe, you know, you'd go to one store, but the robustness of these experiments were really weak compared to what you can do now, right? So that's right. In fact, there there's a special name, I think, for the environments that you can construct online because there's so much more you can do. 
Um, I call them choice engines because actually you're going to some place to make a choice and it's, they're going to help you, whether it's in your own best interest or not, to make a choice. Um, you know, a common example of that is more recent, but I, I like a lot is every time I go to a web page, it's relatively new. I'm given yeah. a choice about what I want to do about cookies. Yeah. And I'm absolutely convinced that that's going to influence what I do. For example, I'm given the choice often, do you want to accept the, the current setting in, with a bright red button? Yeah. Or do you want to do something else with a, a fading gray background and a yeah. fading gray text on a gray background? And then when I do something else, it then gives me four choices. Now, that's a, that is not an accident. The consulting company that has developed that has really carefully designed that to make sure that people accept the standard cookie setting. And the other mm -hmm. thing which I think is quite relevant has to do with timing. So notice I have to do that every time I go to a website. I want to go book a flight. I want to go or order a sweater. I don't want to make a cookie choice then. So I sort of am under pressure to get through then. Now, if yeah. another time someone said, here's what cookies do. What do you want to do on most websites? And that is the default. Now, that would be a much better way of asking me for my preferences to the extent that they exist for cookies. Do right. We talk about how done. We talk about how, you know, a good, a well-designed choice uh, architecture is, is kind of like a conversation, right? So there's a back and forth, right, where the, the environment or the designer of the environment is kind of helping to understand you better, right, through your, through your choices. And, and so this, this gets to that distinction between kind of a, a, like a mass default and, and a more heterogeneous or, or, or customized uh, default, right? And so... You know, I, 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 in my machine learning course, I spent a lot of time talking about dynamic pricing, right, and how you want to give different prices to different folks. But, but you talk about how, you know, you want to give a different menu to, to different folks, right? Now, in order to do this, you have to know something about the, the customer. So you have to have presumably some understanding of their, their history. And so, for instance, United Airlines, right, they, they want me to use their app. They don't want me to go to Kayak or whatever. And if I go to the United Airlines app, They'll always say, you know, they'll always they'll default to ranking the flights based on, you know, what they think is is you know best, right? And you know, I I used to be very suspicious. I'm like, they're just pushing me into the the most expensive flight, you know. <laughs> but then, you know, over time, I kind of realized, yeah, they're they're kind of they're kind of giving me more or less what I'm going to pick, right? They they're going to give me the thing that is most direct. It doesn't leave at six a.m., you know, and so they've They've learned about me over time, but by driving me through that, well, I mean, they have my flight data, but they also kind of, by driving me to the app and getting me to, to kind of engage the app, that's how they kind of help figure it out. So, you know, is, is, is a good engine one that not only kind of predicts what I'm going to do, but gets me to provide them with the information that enables them to predict what I'm going to want. Well, they'll observe that anyway. They'll see what flights you choose, and they have to decide how much they're going to l try and learn about you. But yeah. it, it turns out, and this is a, something that was an education for me, you don't have to use machine learning to learn about your customers. Mm -hmm. um, two very quick examples. My favorite, though, is in retirement plans. The default is called um, essentially a, a, a plan that's appropriate for your age or retirement age, mm -hmm. target date funds. That's what they're called. And they ask one question, how old are you? Right. And they say, okay, that means he'll be 65 in 2050. So we're going to give him a fund that is optimal for people who retire at 2050. Now, all they need to do to do that and really improve my choices is ask me right. my age. Now, you know, if I didn't do that, I would probably put you in a fund that's some, some percentage stocks, some percentage bonds. And the fact is that most people don't change that. So it literally is doing better for me with one question. So, so the cold start problem is overcome because you, you know, you can get a lot of, you can get a lot of insight with, with a super simple, uh, uh, you know, with a super, in fact, they probably don't even have to ask you your age because they probably have your birth date, you know, when you sign up for right. the account. But just in case, so, right. Yeah. But, you know, Spotify, right. What they do is they, when you sign up for a new account with, with Spotify, they, they kind of show you uh, like a, these music bubbles and, you know, and you, you're like, well, which do you like better? You know, you like, you know, 
Jay Z or, or you know, uh, smooth jazz or whatever. And then you, you know, you, with just a few, with it's basically like a decision tree. So, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. I, I've always been surprised at how um, how infrequently, right, vendors will use simple decision trees to just kind of narrow down your, your, your preferences, right? I was, I was speaking earlier with, I think I was t- speaking to Peter Ubel about this, right? When I'm buying a, just a dishwasher, right? You go to Home Depot and you've got like a gazillion options, right? I mean, how hard would it be just to say, okay, well, <laughs> you know, uh, what, what are you trying to do here? Like, how, you know, how many, how many dishes are you going to wash, right? And that kind of thing. I mean, it seems like there are a couple, I mean, for someone who teaches data science, you know that there are like, couple features that'll immediately, you know, re- re- reduce the entropy. Uh, and, and so why don't, or, or think about, you know, you mentioned these COVID um, assessments, right? I was always surprised that there weren't these COVID kind of vulnerability uh, assessment engines available to the general public, you know, relatively early on in the pandemic, because we knew enough and by March of 2020 to, you know, know that, if you're 12 years old, you know, you're in less danger than if you're 82 years old. Like you could, with a ver- with two or three questions, we could probably dramatically narrow the, the, the confidence interval of your vulnerability, right? So, so you know, why do we see, why don't we see more of this, um, this kind of thing? So part, part of it, of course, is that um, if you don't believe choice architecture is going to make a difference, you're unaware that you can customize. Mm-hmm. Um and actually, the other thing is, of course, people think we need to have very fancy machine learning systems. Mm-hmm. And as you point out, often the first two or three nodes are going to get you 90% of the way there. Mm-hmm. Um, our friends at the German car company, uh, you know, we said, oh, wow, there's a lot of heterogeneity here. We can do a fancy system to build, uh, to recommend, recommend a system. They said, no, I think instead of that, we can just ask people. So are you looking for a sports car? So as soon yeah. as you say that, we know something about the engine size. Right. We know something about the that you want a stick shift, not an automatic. Not an automatic. You probably want leather. We may even know something about the color of the car. Yeah. But just identifying, you know, what kind of customer you are with one question did a lot for them. And then they, they just said, once you did that, we changed the defaults. It's the best for that person. If someone who's looking for a family car would get different defaults than somebody who would get a sports car. Yeah, what, what kind of drives me crazy sometimes is when you get these menus where, the, the def- like, for instance, they ask you what country you live in, and the default is Afghanistan. It's always Afghanistan. <laughs> like, you know, right? I mean, how hard is it just to put the U.S. at the top? I know that maybe that that's, sounds a little imperialistic, but, you know, realistically, most of the people are not from. Well, let's say if Af- you lived in Zambia, it's yeah. particularly annoying if Afghanistan right. is up first. Right, right. But U.S. is way at the bottom, and you got to go all the way down or. You know, and you talk at about the very birth end dates. is Zimbabwe is Zimbabwe. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's not U.S. specific. It's just as simple as giving customers what is the easiest response when it's right for them. And, you know, yeah, I suspect with a little bit of IP addressing, you can get that right more often than not. Right. Well, now, another thing you talk about in the book is, is this idea of paradox of, of choice. And I interviewed Barry Schwartz, uh, you know, a while ago, about a year ago or so. And and, you know, I, I think more and more people are aware of this idea of the paradox of choice. And, and the, the, the simple takeaway is that the fewer the options, the, you know, the easier it is to make decisions. And therefore, you know, the, the more likely it is that you're going to want to make in the decision that you like. And this is from, you know, Sheena Iyengar's work and so forth. And, you know, you point out that, well, they don't really say that. I mean, that's the common interpretation. But really, there's more of like a sweet spot for the number of, of choices. So how do we, how do we figure out what that, what that sweet spot is? It's a really interesting question because, you know, I run into students who say, so what's the right number of choices? Three, five percent of people. And it's I sort of say that's a little bit like asking, you know, what's the right number of engines for an airplane? Well, you have to yeah. tell me a little bit more about the airplane, what it's supposed to do. You know, it's not two, it's not four. Who knows? You have to tell me more. So what is what you'd want to know? Well, one thing you really want to know that's neglected is how much do I know about the person? So if I knew Greg was a chocolate fiend who loved dark, dark chocolate, I can present you with a very narrow set of options. But if I don't know that about you, I'm going to have to include more variety there. Maybe you like milk chocolate. Maybe you, will, you, you don't like chocolate at all. So I'm going to have to increase the num- number of options I present there. So I think it really depends a lot about how much I know about you and how much the options vary. I mean, if they're all identical, 
anyone will do. Uh, school choice is a great example of this in, in yeah. the U.S. Uh, in New York, we present people with 769 options. And they go, oh, they range the gamut from essentially a Votech school for learning how to repair cars, important institution, yeah. to essentially some of the most competitive high schools in the country. And mm -hmm. for the average student, they're not going to consider both. And in fact, right. they're organized alphabetically, not by distance or you can't just say, show me only the college prep schools or show, show me only the Votech schools. So that's a great example of where you want to present people a selection that's much smaller than they get otherwise. And you need to know something about them, including maybe where they live. And then you can build right. a set that's maybe eight schools, but they're eight good choices. And so when you have this kind of really, really big list of options, right, you typically resort to some kind of screening, some kind of crude screening, right? Exactly. So, you know, last night when I was at the restaurant and there were 5,000 wines, I was like, all right, look, I'm just going to get an Italian white. And as soon as I decided that, then it was like, okay, there was only like eight wines there. So it made my life a whole whole lot easier. Now, I might not have been picking the, the optimal wine, but but certainly it, it was it was easier once I did that. And right. And, and I know that, you know, employers will do that. They'll just say, okay, I've got 10,000 applicants. So, all right, no college degree, boom. That just, that gets rid of three quarters of the people. Excellent. Woo, my job is so much easier now, right? But they're not, they're, they're, that means that they're necessarily going to be, you know, ne neglect. There's going to be some, some, you know, false negatives there where these, there's going to be people that they, they miss. So, so, you know, is, is that, I mean, how do we overcome those, those, I mean, there's, there's ways in which intelligent kind of choice engines can, can kind of do some of the work to make the choice easier, but give us a, a, a better menu, right? So I think there's a great, a, a large number of situations in which screening is useful, but there's times when it really hurts and condemns you. Um, let's think, for example, about credit cards. In credit cards, you might want to screen on initial annual fee. Mm -hmm. Now, banks are trying to make money, so if you have a low initial fee, you know, um, you're likely to have a higher long-term interest rate. Right. So those attributes are what we call negatively correlated. You get good on one, you can get worse on the other. So that's a great example of where screening. Another of my favorite examples is often, um, it's sort of a little bit cute, but on dating sites. Yeah, I was talking if to Paul Oyer about this recently about you know you just, like you have an age cut off and a geography cut off and a height cut off right. or whatever and and what's the, the the cute part of that is people often have height cutoffs but how about if people lie about yeah, their height right. i've been told that yeah. certain people lie about their height so when you pick men who are taller you're actually picking men who are more likely to be liars mm -hmm. so it's it's a yeah. solution that you know, there, there's a negative correlation. So I think, you know, that now to get to the point, how can you help people do that? I think it's pretty easy to go back to the credit card example. You know, if you can tell me a little bit about yourself, like how much you typically carry out of balance, I could get a, get, a good guess about how much it's going to cost you to use that card for mm -hmm. a year. It can do the math for you. And so I think that's a really important way of, you know, we talked about choice engines. We can customize them, but they can also build in calculators. Yeah. They actually have an estimate based on what I've told them, or even better, what they've observed about how I use the credit card. Of course, the problem there is that people have to understand, like, for instance, you know, when we're choosing a health care plan, the question is, okay, how many times do you expect to go to the doctor? Right. Well, people are pretty bad at forecasting that. Or, you know, um, how, how much do you think your balance is going to be in a year? Okay, well, you know, there are a lot of studies on the credit cards that show that people systematically underestimate, you know, what their re revolving balance is, is going to be when they, when they you know, jump for those 0% cards. So, you know, is, is that a situation where it, it's helpful for the architect to say, you know what, most people like you are, are going to, you know, are actually going to have this and then, you know, let them, let them choose. I, th I think the idea of using data to give people, you know, someone your age, you know, typically goes to the doctor X times. Mm -hmm. Now giving them that, is, you, you know, this term as an anchor, will probably get mm -hmm. them closer to the truth than just saying, how many times have you gone to the doctor where they're trying to retrieve from memory? I think the right. same thing is true. If, if you carry a balance, you know, ask them a question like, so what was the last, how, how much do you currently own on your credit card? 
that's mm-hmm. probably going to be the best predictor of how much they're going to carry monthly forward from then. So I do think that in terms of assembling preferences that assembly and assembling beliefs, we can really help people by actually focusing them on numbers they know and not asking them for, you know, you know, you know what do you think your credit score will be in a year? I don't know yeah. what that's going to be. Well, so a lot, of, a lot of your work is really about kind of fluency also, right? So this is about, you know, making decisions kind of easier. And, and part of that is making kind of comparisons easier. And so a big element of this is kind of visual presentation, visual representation. So you, you have a whole section in the book on kind of, you know, signs and icons and uh, images. And, um, you know, is, is this an area, I mean, we, we're surrounded by images, we're surrounded by visuals, we're surrounded by, by graphics. And, and yet, you know, most people don't really understand how to interpret them. I mean, I, I was recently reading in a respectable, journal, respectable newspaper where the, the x-axis wasn't even identified. And I'm wondering if anybody even noticed, but me, I think I might have been the only person that's like, wait, there's no, what is the X? Like the, it was, it was showing, I think it was showing like, um, I don't know, the, the performance of some asset and it ended with, you know, today's date, but it didn't, I, am I looking at months, years, days? Like I had no idea. And, and, and yet it seemed to somehow slip through the editor's grasp. So do we need to, you know, think more carefully about uh, the visual re- representation of, of data. One, one example of this I remember is, um, you know, they would ask people for a pain, pain number from one to 10. And I think they, when they would put smiley faces on there, it would elicit kind of different responses than when it was just a number scale. Um, and you talk about the miles per gallon and there, I think it's not just the visual representation, but it's actually just the, 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 the number itself doesn't make any sense and it's hard to make sense of. Right. So, I mean, I think we, like we neglect lots of choice architecture, we often neglect the symbols we use. Um, in New York City, they wanted to have a symbol for high sodium dishes, and so they gave you a black salt shaker. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know. I thought when I first saw that, that might mean, oh, the dish needs more salt. I mean, yeah. it, it doesn't help. So there have been some good examples of how to do this, and that's often combining a, techno- a technology that people know well. So a classic one is traffic lights. People know red yeah yellow and green and the best in my opinion sites actually combine that with numbers so they'll show you what the numbers of calories and the amount of salt is mm-hmm. for green versus red versus yellow and i think that's for those who don't know the numbers that helps them because they can use a tech uh, uh, an analog that they understand analogy that they understand well which mm-hmm. is the traffic light for those who and they can learn and those who know already what the numbers correspond to so i think that's mm-hmm. a a useful combination. This is an area that's incredibly important, and it's amazing how little effort has been put into the, that development of that. I mean, basically, it's a committee sits around and says, "Oh, what do I think I'd like?" As obviously yeah. an area that needs lots of research. Yeah, and I think that ties back to the physical architecture piece as well. I remember on campus here in Berkeley, we used to have these uh, re- recycling bins, and. Um, you know, you'd have three three holes, and they were all the same size and shape. And, you know, one was for plastics and one was for glass. And so, you know, as you were approaching the bin with your bottle, you, you had no idea which, which bin you were supposed to go into. And you had to kind of get up to close to the thing and kind of read the label. And and whereas, you know, now they've replaced it with these bins that have, you know, kind of circles and for the bottles and rectangles for the paper. And so... You know, when you're like 30 yards away from this thing, you already know, you know, where you're going to put your, 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 your item. And, and that seems to, that probably has, you know, increased dramatically the, the, you know, the proper sorting of these things. Yeah. I'm talking to you from our lovely new business school building at Columbia Business School, and we made exactly the same mistake. I stand there and go, where does the water bottle go? I mean, right. and part of the problem is nobody thinks from the perspective of the user. You know, the, the architect said, oh, this is lovely. It doesn't really clash. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. it also isn't very functional. And I think yeah. the key point is fluency is the way you get around present bias. You make the right behavior very easy. You reduce the barriers to entry. And so mm-hmm. recycling, that's a, a very good case. Um, and hopefully people learn the habit so the costs get even lower, almost zero. So um, I, I recently, I've, I've been teaching over the last 10 years or so, I've been occasionally teaching uh, courses and programs on 
design thinking, right? And, you know, this is sort of some, something that a lot of business schools have uh, adopted, you know, they've copied it from engineering schools. And I think it was originally like, a, I remember 20 years ago, it was like human factors was the, what they called it in, in the engineering school. Um, but when I was, you know, teaching this, I, I realized that what I, I was basically just teaching behavioral economics, right? I mean, I was, I was teaching, you know, uh, the, the science of, you know, observation and rationality and decision making and so forth. And, you know, do you think that going back to kind of the, the curricular design and, you know, where this stuff needs to be, I mean, it seems like choice architecture needs to be in every class, but is, is, is kind of design thinking an area that is like doing choice architecture without even realizing it or without, without calling it that? I mean, what are the overlaps there between those two fields? I've thought about it a lot. And one place I got the opportunity is I was in Washington working for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Yeah. And we'd sit and think about form design. And, you know, the designers were great. They would produce very lovely forms. But what they weren't aware of is they were trying to maximize fluency only. They were trying to say, mm -hmm. what makes people like this form? And they weren't yeah. concerned with what is the option people are going to choose as a result of that. So they cared less about what the order of options were. They cared less about a default. A default from a design perspective is good because it makes the choice easier, more fluid. But it might be the wrong default. So I think what what you're calling behavioral economics, what choice architecture brings to the party, is a real concern, not just with feeling about the decision, but how good the decision itself is. And I think that's, right. that's the key contribution because you can feel really good about forms that are making you do very bad things. Mm -hmm. Now, to what extent do we do you think we need to, um, you know, regulate choice architecture? So, you know, FTC is is concerned about you know deception, right? And so, if you you know deceive somebody, well, clearly that's you know something we need to we need to regulate. Um, failure to disclose, okay, that's something else that you know I think is there's an obvious case for that. But is is there is there should we you know, be thinking about um, if someone designs something, they're, they're, they're you know, they, they give people all the options. They, they kind of, somewhere in there, they tell you what, what the consequence of all the options are, but it's designed in such a way that steers people towards something that is kind of welfare reducing for them. Like, is it, is, how should, I mean, because it's clear that disclosure is just plain disclosure is, is, is not enough. Um, how, do we need to, do we need to think about regulating it or do we think need to think about kind of just educating people to be more sophisticated consumers? I mean, I know for me, I mean, I've had enough of these classes that anytime I get an offer in the mail, I'm like, all right, I got to, you know, what's going on here, right? I'm, I'm, I'm hyper conscious of the subliminal manipulation, but we can't expect everybody to, to you know, be uh, vigilant in that way. I mean, education helps, but it can't be the entire solution and it's very expensive. I mean not just in the kinds of places that you and I teach, but even in grammar school, if you're teaching about choice architecture, which I think you should, you're doing less on other subjects. So there's always, mm -hmm. you know, is education the most effective way of doing things? At the same time, you know, I think the notion of defaults is a really simple thing to teach. And in fact, most people, if you ask them, were they influenced by the default? They say, maybe I, I, I wasn't, maybe someone else would. So to your point about, you know, even warning people, disclosure is not necessarily yeah. going to do it. So I think it's it's really important. One place, go back to the cookie example. One of the things that goes on there, they've made one option a lot harder to choose than another. Mm -hmm. That is, if I want to choose all cookies, I just press one red button. If I want to customize cookie, I have to find the button. It's harder. And then I have to read a bunch of text about functional cookies and, and so on and so on. Another option is you could just say, uh, I want cookies, I don't want cookies. Make the costs symmetric. In computer mm -hmm. science, they sometimes call this phenomena dark patterns, where it's very mm -hmm. easy to go down the wrong path. And they talk about essentially symmetry. You know, when I call up to subscribe for a new, oh, let's put it this way. When I'm on the website, I click and I get the newspaper. When I want to cancel it at the end of the 99 cent fee, I have to call them and be, I'm on hold. That's an asymmetry. The costs are much greater getting out than getting in. In fact, in computer science, there's a, a cute name for this, which is sometimes called the Roach Hotel from the old commercials. The yeah, roaches yeah. check in and they never leave. 
all the customers. I think you have to be you either have to leave. you have to either be from the East Coast or above a certain age to to get that reference because most right. of my students look at me blankly when I talk about the Roach Motel. I understand, but the interesting thing is the, the well, as soon as you explain what a Roach Hotel is, you know, essentially a, a glue trap, and that's really sort of the idea. So maybe you can't regulate exactly what font things should be in, but no, the notion that the effort for the two options should be equal is something that's, you know, if you can do an A-B test, you can see if that's true. Mm-hmm. Well, are there certain industries and sectors where maybe, um, the, you know, maybe certain regulated industries where uh, there ought to be greater scrutiny? I mean, look, for the, if you're going to introduce a new drug, then, you know, you got to go through FDA approval and you got to do clinical trials and so forth. But if you're going to introduce like a new uh, EMR, right, that you don't you don't have to do any of that, right? And you, you talk about one particularly nefarious case in the book where, you know, there's an EMR that was basically available for free to, to you know, small doctors, which included all sorts of, you know, advertising, right? And so they would say, you know, hey, be sure to ask about pain and be sure to, you know, see if they want to take some of these highly addictive drugs uh, that'll, you know, land them on the street in a few years. Um, I mean, there it seems like the... The, the the costs are, are so high that maybe, you, you know, there, there ought to be more supervision or at least potential liability. Or certainly, you know, you talk about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. I mean, there are certain potentially toxic products, loan products, or, or you know, that, that could, you know, devastate people's financial health. I mean, are, are there certain domains maybe where, um, I don't know, there ought to be greater scrutiny or at least people have be held to a higher standard, uh, you know, legally? Well, I mean, I, let me step back just for a second and say that, you know, people are going to do evil, uh, whether it's not just choice architecture. They have lots of other ways of doing evil, mm-hmm. including lying, misrepresenting. It's, it's The problem is not just about choice architecture. And so but lying and representing, we, we already have, I mean, we, we, we've got that covered, right? I mean, there's there's fraud, there's tort law, there's, there's you know, there's regulation, there's all sorts of stuff. So a very interesting question, which I don't have an answer to, is should choice architecture ever be used, for example, you know, for damages? Can you sue mm-hmm. for bad choice architecture? And there yeah. are some cases, actually, I was, uh, Cass Sunstein was talking about the Northwestern University pension plan was being sued because they were presenting <laughs> options to faculty. You know, yeah. those allegedly smart people badly. Now, I, you know, that is going to be in the courts a while, but that's that's an example. So there there are legal remedies that you could think about, um, but I also think they're fairly simple common sense things, and they're not going to be. Mm-hmm. The problem is bureaucrats are, are likely to say things like, you know, you have to have an eleven point font, you know, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera. Um, and I think just principles like you know you should make it as easy to opt in as to opt out um, mm-hmm. would would go part of the way. I think you have to regulate the the cost to the customer as opposed to you know the actual engineering of 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 the disclosure because you know with disclosures you end up with more text not less you end Mm -hmm. up with onion skin paper that's impossible to read you know there's Mm -hmm. just lots of reasons that regulating the means as opposed to the ends i think is difficult yeah well you know you, you talk about how a good um kind of choice engine is like a conversation between the provider and, and the user. But, you know, you also talk about how um, it, 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 there's a teaching function involved, right? So when people in, engage in these, in these engines, they, they learn a little bit. And I think, you know, the Obamacare example is, 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 a, is an interesting one, right? Because most people don't know anything about healthcare insurance. Most people don't know anything about their future liabilities. They don't really know. Any, I mean, you know, can you create some interaction which is sufficiently engaging that people will, you know, spend enough time with it so that they can learn how to become kind of better, better decision makers? Is this, is this something we can we can aspire aspire to? Right? Um, is this sort of an element of good good design? Should we be thinking about the educational impact of of good choice architecture? Yeah, I mean, I think the great thing about choice engines is not only can they be customized. Not, not only, um, but they can also help you with comprehension. They can teach you. Mm-hmm. So you can find out something. So uh, my wife, who's one of the smartest um, mathematical psychologists I know, who in fact, you know, is a chair professor at Princeton, when she saw the word deductible, 
she said, oh, that's good. That's something. That's how much money I save. Right. Now, of course, deductibles aren't bad. So having actually a little balloon help saying, here's what a deductible is and here's why you should care is potentially helpful. Um, yeah. I don't want to oversell it. It solves the problem entirely. But I think the calculator that would include the deductible as a cost would also be useful. But I do think there could be some education. And again, just to go back to something we've talked about already, setting, giving me some information about what a typical user does. You know, what's going to mm -hmm. be my typical number of times to the doctor? What's the probability that I'll have a catastro catastrophic health incident, you know, where a car accident, you know, that is useful and that can be done. So the key here is basically helping people assemble better preferences by giving them yeah. information they need and not having them focus on and what people normally do is actually it turns out they focus on premium because mm -hmm. they know that's very vivid. It's going to be something they have to pay every month. And that yeah. turns out not the only thing they should be thinking about. Well, that's where that's where simulations can come in handy. Right. So, you know, creating a really easy to operate simulation. You talk about, um, you know, uh, Sullenberger and Sully and you know how he was able to land the plane in the Hudson um, because and I guess you were you were on you either on the same flight, same different flight, same day. I, I was at a gate nearby. Fortunately, not yeah. on that flight. I would have been. My apartment overlooks the Hudson, so I would have seen it come down. Yeah, but a great, but a great. I mean, one of the reasons, two of the reasons why he was successful was one. First of all, you know, simulations are out there and available for pilots, but also you know, good user interface, and user design. So, um, you know, can we can we design? simulations that are easy to understand for people when they're making important kind of life choices that will help them, I don't know, make it more, more salient rather than, you know, abstract. So if you're trying to figure out a healthcare plan, maybe, you know, run, run a couple, I don't know, provide somebody with a Monte Carlo simulation of their life, and, you know, let them see what, you know, what the impact is. So I was very lucky. Um, Dan Goldstein, who's my co-author on the Oregon Nation work, also introduced me, and we did work together with a Nobel laureate who's down the road from you at Stanford named Bill Sharp. Uh, for the uh -huh. MBAs in the audience, that's the person who invented the notion of the Sharp factor, which is how you think about risk in investments. And he had this marvelous idea, which was basically, we ask people now, how do you want to invest in terms of like stocks or bonds and percentages? That's not what they care about. What do people care about? They care about the amount of money they'll have mm -hmm. when they retire. Now, the problem with that is, I can't tell you a number because markets are risky, but I can tell you if you have more stock, you're going to have yeah. a broader outcome. You know, you're going to have higher highs and lower lows. If you're going to invest bonds, you're going to have give up a lot of income, but you'll have a narrow spread. Mm -hmm. So he and Dan invented something. I helped them with this called the distribution builder. Where you basically said, I want to present 80% stocks, 20% bonds. And they showed you the distribution. They literally simulated yeah. the distribution. And then here's the really cute idea. They then said, okay, press a button. And then all but one of those little tokens disappeared. Mm -hmm. And you can do that over and over and over again and see how you felt if you made, you know, yeah. $100,000 a year in retirement, $200,000 a year in retirement, $30,000 a year. So simulations, particularly under decisions under risk, I think are really a neglected area. I love that paper. It's been neglected, but I think it's really a valuable idea. Um, one last thing about simulation. The, you had asked me about how you know whether someone's made a good decision. One thing you can do is create the equivalent of a flight simulator. Mm -hmm. That is, we know if a cockpit has a good design because you can land it um, SFO. You can land it Charles de Gaulle. I mean, under different conditions, you do the right thing. Now, one thing I can do is I can say, you you have three kids, they go to the doctor this number of times, can you pick the right health insurance? So I know what you should be doing in that case and see if you can find it. I, I call it the decision simulator approach. Yeah. So in many domains, I may not know what you exactly want, but I can tell you what you need to find and see if you can find it. And that's super helpful, I think. Well, Eric, this has been great. Um, look, choice architecture, choice engines, Choice simulators. I mean, there's a lot of fun stuff in this book. Uh, definitely check it out, Elements of Choice. Um, thanks so much for joining me and, and hope to chat again sometime soon. Greg, thanks so much for having me and thanks for all your listeners' time. I appreciate it very much. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.